Um, since that time, he uh, took a position at Drexel University in Philadelphia in the Department of Chemical Engineering. Uh, he's been there for a few years now, and just this summer I heard the good news that he was appointed to full professor, so he will continue to be there for a while if he wants to be. Um, so it's a okay. pleasure to introduce him, and he can tell you the title of his talk. Thank Great. you very much. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Um, so uh, I'm not a metadynamics person, unfortunately, uh, but I do have a student who's done metadynamics. If you want to learn about what, what I've uh, done with metadynamics in my group, please go see Michelle's poster. I'll give that a uh, little ad at the beginning. So instead of talking about metadynamics, I'll talk about some other methods that I've worked on uh, in the rec recent uh, past, uh, broadly uh, temperature acceleration and the string method. Um, and what I'm showing here on the first title slide is an example of why we're motivated to do uh, large-scale conformational sampling to observe rare events in biomolecular simulations. This is the uh, a crystal structure of the HIV-1 matrix protein. It's actually the protein that self multiple copies self-assemble during the budding process of a virus and when it's being produced by an infected cell that builds the scaffold uh, that, that actually defines the shape of the virus. Uh, it's also a, 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 when a virus infects a cell, the, the matrix proteins are dissociated into the target cell and they have binding partners that actually enhance the rate and the, the viability of the virus that, that infects the cell as well. So it's a very important uh, This is the only structure that's known in the literature, uh, but it must have many, many other structures to bind to the, all of the other proteins that it binds to. And so uh, if you run an MD simulation of this guy, which is a fun thing to do, of course I could make this a workshop, just running one little MD simulation, uh, which is one nanosecond. Uh, we don't see any real changes of shape in this uh, protein that would lead us to think that it could bind a wide variety of other proteins. And so uh, with enhanced sampling, one can generate confirmations as, such, as, such as this one, where a particular binding epitope is spontaneously opened, uh, and then one can then postulate how other proteins could, could bind. So this is an example of uh, one reason why we want to do these kinds of enhanced sampling techniques. So I'm going to jump right in with some equations here and first explain temperature, acceler ex temperature accelerated MD. This is really due to the work of Luca Marignano and Eric Van Den Eyden, who's my current collaborator. Um, so the basic idea behind temperature acceleration is to first imagine that in addition to the atomic variables of your MD simulation, auxiliary variables, I'll call these Z variables, okay? This potential looks like a harmonic restraint where uh, some collective variable theta, theta can be anything you want. We've already uh, determined, we talked about that earlier in the workshop. It's important that you realize there are functions of the configuration of the variable and this kappa would represent a spring constant. So you could say, choose a value of z that you want to tether theta to, uh, and you can have multiple thetas, that's why I have a summation here that can be independent of each other, and then this represents a, a, an augmented potential whereby the values of collective variables are restrained to, to a certain set of z's. Okay, and so one can run atomic dynamics on this potential, and then what pops up again, of course, is the, the Newtonian terms here. But as well, then you have the harmonic forces that involve the Jacobian of the collective variables and the forces. Okay, and then of course this is, this is a constant temperature. You have to have in addition to that in the equation of motion, you have a thermostat. And I'm going to use beta to represent temperature. Of course, it's inverse temperature. The key thing uh, in TAM is that instead of letting these or stipulating that these z variables are constant, a chosen value at which you want to restrain your simulation, you actually allow them to evolve slowly. So they obey their own dynamics. And in this case, I've written down uh, overdamp dynamics for these variables z. So this is the time derivative of z, uh, a particular one, j. Okay, uh, And it has the force that's the, obviously the, the uh, negative of the force that's being communicated to the atoms. And it can run, these dynamics can be run at a thermostat that's at a different temperature. Okay, So I'm denoting, denoting that different temperature with beta bar. Now, the other parameter of, of interest here in, in the overdamp dynamics, at least, is this friction gamma bar. Uh, sort of the key insight that Luca and Eric uh, brought forth in, in, in de deriving temperature acceleration is that if you run the dynamics coupled, okay, but you choose this friction be buried in the thermostat terms. If you make, if you enforce this large separation of time scales, make the z's evolve slowly, then you essentially self-average this quantity in time around the vari around the values of z. So it's as if you're computing a mean force. If you were to do a potential mean force calculation, you would run an MD simulation or a series of, of calculations to re reconstruct a potential mean force. You would select your values of z and run independent simulations for each of those values, accumulate mean forces using restrained MD, and then reconstruct a potential energy or a potential mean force. 
Now, instead of doing that, we're just letting so the system moves on the fly. Okay? Uh, and in this limit, these, uh, these gradients that are being communicated to the Z's self-average to approximate gradients in free energy. Now that free energy, there are two things important to note about it in this formulation. One is that it's a free energy that's being computed at the atomistic temperature beta, not the temperature at which the Z's evolve, beta bar, different temperature. The second is that this free energy is not the true free energy, and you've seen the formula for that free energy now at least four times since we've been here. It's that integral with the delta function. That's not what this is. Okay, it's the mollified free energy. It's the one where the delta function has been replaced by a Gaussian. All right, and the limit where the, the um, variance of the Gaussian becomes infinitely small divided by the value of the variance, you get a delta function. And so this is an approximate free energy in the sense that, that the length scale that the the length scale enforced by the spring constant gives you something like the resolution of the free energy surface. Okay. Now, the, the final kicker is that if you take beta bar to be less than beta, or you take beta bar to be less than t, you can accelerate the exploration uh, of z space. Okay. So that in one dimension, that might look something like this. So let's suppose. Uh, that this is a free energy profile in one dimension with a, a, a nice double well. And if you were to simply say at, at some temperature, uh, pick a temperature beta, whatever it is, this happens to be then the probability distribution. Okay, the purple curve is the probability. So you would anticipate that if this represented a, a sort of coarse grain variable from an MB simulation, if you initialize here, I don't have a little guy with a mustache that's going to jump around, unfortunately. Uh, that was quite cute, though. I like that. Um, maybe I'll do that some, sometime later. Uh, but anyway, so it would never, never leave. And the, what TAM does is generate trajectories in Z space or statistics in Z space that obey this formula, where you have beta bar as the prefactor, but f of z is still the same free energy. So this free energy is not changing. All that's changing is the probability. So when you simply make beta bar less than beta, what you do is you end up attenuating the, the Boltzmann factor, and you get smaller peaks and shallower troughs. And so now, on this probability distribution, an MD simulation would have no trouble going back and forth between these two states. OK, so that's the basic idea in temperature acceleration. And so, um, of course, uh, I, when, I, when Eric, I had to listen to Eric give a talk about this a few times before I got turned on to it, the first protein I thought this would be fun to apply to is this one. This is Groel chaperonin. So what you're looking at here are crystal structures of Groel chaperonin states. OK, so what is Groel? It's a homo tetradecameric protein folding catalyst. Uh, basically, it's the protein that's responsible for helping other proteins fold. OK. Uh, and this happens to be from E. coli. There are two seven-member rings, and each ring, uh, each of these members is a subunit that's about 500 amino acids long. Uh, and this is the this is what I'll simulate: just the subunit, not the entire complex. Uh, those simulations are still running. Particular uh, view of the of the two rings is in the T state, so-called T state, tense. Uh, if a co-chaperone called GROES happens to bind to one side of this symmetric complex. Uh, then you will find these subunits in the so-called R double prime state. And the main difference between these two is where this apical domain is positioned relative to the equatorial domain, has been rotated and shifted by a large amount. So it's a very large scale conformational change. By virtue of the fact that these two crystal structures exist for exactly the same protein, we know that this, this, uh, comp or this complex, then this protein undergoes very large scale conformational changes. Okay, so it's just an example uh, of uh, 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 something from the PDB data bank where we know this protein is very flexible. Okay, so uh, ideally, what what one would like to do uh, is if you if you pretend like you don't know this state exists, you'd like to ask what are the possible states that this guy can can uh, visit on long time scales. One would like to do an enhanced sampling and see whether or not this state is actually visited in that enhanced sampling. Okay, the first thing to do if you're going to apply any enhanced sampling method is to come up with a collective variable that you want to push. In this case, I'm working with uh, a rather large collective variable space where uh, I simply define subdomains of the protein structure such that each major domain has at least three subdomains. Okay, so these centers, each one of these, is this is just a schematic representation. This is an actual view of what they look like in a particular uh, configuration. Each one of these balls is, represents the center of mass of a part of the protein, and uh, they're non-overlapping. 
And so uh, this has three degrees of freedom, that has three degree of, degrees of freedom, and so forth. So this is a total of nine uh, subdomain centers, three degrees of freedom each. That's 27 collective variables. So I have a 27 dimensional collective variable space here. Okay? Um, and so what we find is when we run a temperature acceleration where we, the, the vector of collective variables is uh, the x, y, and z coordinate of each one of those centers. So I have 20, this summation would go out to 27 in the case of this particular protein. And I run TAM simulations, temperature accelerated simulations on this in a fully atomistic uh, explicit solvent system. Depending upon the value I choose, I call that T2, that should be T bar, unfortunately, the notation's switching here, uh, 6K cal per mole. If, that, if that's the scale at which I uh, accelerate the sampling, what I observe is the following. This is a movie uh, that, that constitutes basically a 40 nanosecond long simulation where I start in the R, or start in the T state and it, after a while it spontaneously visits the R double prime state, which is just shown here for reference in the gray uh, background, the uh, gray sort of static uh, representation. So um, if you blink, you might miss it, but a few times it gets very close to overlapping that. So I know what's happening here is that we're close, at least, to the uh, R double prime state. So this came out back in 2010, this particular result. Quantifying that, uh, what we did is measure the root mean square deviation, this is for all, this is for alpha carbon RMSD, against the R double prime structure. Time equals zero corresponds to the T state, and each one of these curves is a separate trajectory. The white curve is a normal MD simulation that only ran for 20, nan 20 nanoseconds before we decided to stop it. Each one of these curves is a separate TAM simulation with a different level of acceleration, a different beta bar. Okay. So for uh, the one that was the most promising for us was the 6K cal per mole one, which got to below 5 angstroms RMS against the target structure. Okay. So blindly, we get within 5 angstroms. That's not too bad for a, a blind search on a protein that's 500 amino acids long. Um, my, my only uh, sort of uh, provision in choosing those collective variables was that I wanted to make sure I can enforce independent rigid body motion of the domains without ripping them apart. Now, if you apply enough acceleration, you do rip the domains apart, and that's actually what's happening here at 20 and 40 kcals per moles, that those centers of mass actually are energetic enough that they move apart and the domains actually unfold. But for all energies below that we tried, the domains did not unfold, and for 6K cal per moles, we got the closest to the target structure, blindly. Okay, so that was fun. Um, but it's just a, merely a, a, a demonstration that this uh, temperature acceleration is something that can do conformational sampling on a rather large scale. Um, so my student, Harish Vashith, who's now a postdoc with Charlie Brooks, had, uh, decided he wanted to try to look at this in the case of a kinase. And this, in, this, in this case is not the kinase we saw before, but this is insulin receptor kinase. So it's actually a fragment of the insulin receptor. And the goal here was to try and understand the mechanism by which uh, the inactive form of the kinase goes to the active form. And so what I want to point out here uh, is that these, are, these are both crystal structures, and this is the, the loop that Michaela was mentioning before. This is actually called the activation loop in the, in the, uh, in the insulin receptor kinase. There's a phenylalanine residue right there, okay, that's on this, this end of the activation loop that's in, that's put in the wrong place with respect to the active structure. So the active structure or the inactive structure has this uh, th this collection of residues here, the green ones called the C spine, the catalytic spine. The gap that would be there, and here it is in the active form, when that phenylalanine is not there, that gap is where the nucleotide binds, where ATP binds to, to initiate catalysis. So the, in going from inactive to active, it's out of there and be inserted into the, the so-called R spine, the regulatory spine. Once it's there, you have an active kinase. So this is the this is the definition of inactive and active in terms of kinases is where does that phenylalanine sit? Is it blocking the binding pocket or is it in the uh, R spine? And so the loop, the, con the configuration of the loop is that that joins the bottom of the R spine uh, to that phenylalanine is also very different in these two cases. So what Harish did was he ran a TAM simulation where he accelerated centers of mass of continu contiguous groupings of residues along just the A loop and decided to see uh, what parameters he would need in order, in order to see the A loop both move into an, an, in, an active conformation and also simultaneous, simultaneously inject that phenylalanine into the R spine. And so uh, this is an example of one of those runs. This is the RMSD against the when you show, yeah, if you run just measuring the A loop, uh, when you turn on TAM, it, it, it accumulates for a while and then it starts to go down. 
Uh, and then this is the particular uh, signal that get, guarantees us the phenylalanine is going into the right place. So we see after 20 seconds, we've injected into the R spine that phenylalanine. And this is a series of snapshots that, sh that, that shows, starting from here, going around, shows us the, the, the actual trajectory of the loop and how it looks like compared to the uh, active form. But the important thing, or sort of the interesting thing we saw, is that during this transition, a key feature was a transient folding and then unfolding of an alpha helix, uh, two and a half turns of helix. And that, that two and a half turns seemed to be coupled with, uh, the folding of that helix seemed to be coupled with the removal of the phenylalanine from its improper position, injection into its proper position. Now, the big question was, we, did, we saw this, this thing, this process happening in an enhanced sampling simulation. And we all, we are, have already seen in other cases that you can't infer necessarily directly a mechanism for a change from enhanced sampling because the statistics are not correct. Uh, this, they've been attenuated and we don't know the partition function here so I can't actually unbias this directly. So the question is, is this representative of a pathway of minimal free energy through a large dimensional collective variable space? So this leads directly to the string method uh, in collective variables. So the idea behind string method is that if you have two states and you've defined a collective variable space that characterizes them so that they're different in those variables. Uh, in principle, one can connect them by a path through that CV space and then allow that path to evolve to a pathway of minimum free energy, not unlike the pathway that was being described in the last talk. This is an example I've taken directly from Lucas' paper of 2000. The year's not there. It's a 2008 paper. Um, of our old friend alanine dipeptide again. Uh, and the same plot you've seen before. Now the, the, the idea with string method is that you then you run with replicas. Each one of these points, this is an initial string, each one of these points represents an MD system, an MD image. We're strained at that point in CD space. So this, this is the case where you've got, okay, your P angle is 50, minus 40 or whatever and your, your Xi angle is 110 or whatever. And so that point is a restrained MD simulation. Okay, and then each one of these is a respective restrained MD simulation. So this represents some initial path. Now the idea with string method is that you, just like with TAMD, you allow each one of these images, Z variables, to evolve in response to the gradients in free energy. And where do you get those gradients from? TAMD. The TAMD simulation is running and self-averaging those gradients. So these guys will actually fall down gradients in free energy. The other important bit is that the evolution of the Zs has to have a reparameterization term that guarantees that the images stay apart from each other. Otherwise, what happens is that most of these images would go to one basin or another. They have to feel one. They feel that they're on a string. So this bit here is called is called the parameterization term, or the or the, the, uh, the term that actually maintains spacing between the images. Okay. So all you have to do then is run a a, a, ser a set of coupled replica simulations from some initial path, allow the Z's to evolve, and eventually this thing will collapse into a pathway connecting the two states of minimal free energy, and that pathway will be itself minimal in free energy. One once, at any point, one can actually uh, integrate along the path as well. If you let alpha be a variable that takes you along a path, then this, uh, the chain rule here will easily tell, the, tell you that you can get the difference in free energy going from position zero to position S along a path. And so you can, at any point uh, in uh, string calculation, you can calculate the free energy along the path. Now, it's somewhat um, uh, easy to envision this in two dimensions, because you can, we can talk about two-dimensional space. Uh, and string the really nice thing about string method is that you're not limited to low dimensional spaces. You can work in very large dimensional spaces and, it's, and you still are computing a free energy that's a function of a distance along a path. All right. So uh, we applied this to the kinase problem where we used the TAMD, uh, we used configurations harvested from the TAMD simulations to generate an initial path and then these are uh, allowed to converge using string method. We had 22 images in this case. Uh, and what we discovered is that as a result of converging the string to the minimal free energy path, the uh, helical intermediate was robust. It seems to be an actual uh, element in the uh, transition mechanism of forming the active kinase. Now, I won't go into too many details about why I think that particular fact is significant, other than uh, other kinases display helices. In fact, if you can remember back to Michaela's kinase, there was a nice helix there. Uh, the other one is that um, a helix as an intermediate is a target for a drug that could keep it from going to the active form or maybe help it. Okay, so um, 
that was fun, uh, except now uh, we wanted to look at a, a, take a more holistic approach and look at, a, look at uh, an, an entire protein that also goes from one state to another. Uh, that involves a relatively uh, well characterized change that is somewhat mysterious about what catalyzes that change. So we are going to talk now about another protein, beta-2 microglobulin, and uh, why it forms amyloid plaques. So this is a protein that's been uh, studied. The, these are structures that come from uh, NMR. The picture here is that in the native form, or in the healthy form of this, this particular protein, there's a proline that's uh, in one hydrophobic pocket when it becomes amyloidogenic, we think it goes into another hydrophobic pocket. This flip of the proline in, uh, requires a cis-trans isomerization of the peptide bond immediately upstream of it. Uh, so it's a relatively rare kind of transition. And too transient to observe in NMR. So the NMR experiment actually looked at a mutant. And it was a mutant that was made stable by deleting some of its residues. So what we wanted to do was build a model of the the, uh, the transient form that was full-length wild-type uh, uh, protein, and then ask uh, uh, what, what are the important uh, determinants for this particular transition. This is an important protein in the uh, dialysis-related amyloidogenesis. People who suffer from diabetes uh, will often have to go undergo dialysis, and this is a protein that's, that's found in blood that will then build up in, in high concentrations in synovial fluids of the joints. And when that happens, they can form plaques in the joints, and it's very, very painful. Uh, it's thought that what triggers its aggregation in the synovial fluid is the fact that the pH of the fluid actually goes down under dialysis. So there's, a, there's a, the idea that a low pH transition. So uh, we looked at the sequence here, and there are a couple of histidines, which could go from neutral to protonated at a, a very small shift in pH. And so we asked, well, what are the role of those histidines when they're protonated? And so to choose collective variables for this, we ended up uh, choosing uh, 20 important uh, inter-alpha carbon distances that discriminate the two states. Okay, that was uh, th those were found using a statistical approach, and then uh, including in, in them uh, the His 31 Pro 32 peptide dihedral angle. So we have 21 collective variables to describe this transition. All right, and this is just a, an illustration of what they are uh, in the view. This is in the view of the. Um, the, the healthy uh, protein. And then we ran what we call on the fly string method. So, uh, what you're looking at here is a string. If you follow the white line, you're seeing 27 images of the protein. This is in a large water box, so all of them are in one big box. And um, so it's about 2 million atoms or so. Each one of them is lightly restrained at a position on a grid inside that box. Okay? And then uh, each one of them represents a different image along this, config, this conformational change pathway. So the idea here is this was run um, where the Z, the Z variables are moving in lockstep with the atomistic variables. And so everything is happening on the fly. Uh, we don't have to use an iterative approach to converge the string. And so we run this and for the two different cases where we have uh, neutral histidines and protonated histidines. So these are the free energies along the minimal free energy paths for these two cases. Uh, and so uh, this is a reaction coordinate, and zero corresponds to healthy beta 2m, and one corresponds to the amyloidogenic intermediate. The blue curve is the unprotonated case, and the red curve is the protonated case. All right, so the first thing you'll notice is that the protonated case, compared to the unprotonated case, has a stable state at the intermediate. So protonated histidines is making the, making the uh, amyloidogenic form uh, more stable relative to the healthy form than if you do not uh, protonate the histidine. All right, and the second thing is that the barrier heights here uh, are predicted on the order of 10 kcals per mole, 10 to 15 kcals per mole, are in line with activation en energy barriers for bare prolyl cis trans isomerization measured experimentally, to be about 20 kcals per mole. Uh, and so we can say that, you know, comparing these numbers with that number, that this is a process that seems to be catalyzed uh, by other parts of the protein besides just the peptide bond itself. And uh, real quick, we can look at some snapshots from the pathway and try and explain where we, well, why we think that is. This is the unprotonated uh, selection of, uh, of snapshots from the unprotonated pathway, Pro32 flipping from one side to the other here. Here's a transition state. This is the state at which the, the peptide bond is at a particular angle between the cis and trans. If we look down from the top, what we see, there's the proline, uh, proline 32 moving from one pocket to another. Okay, And um, in the case of the protonated pathway, 
There's an additional player here, as, uh, aspartate 34, which is still charged, negatively charged. What seems to be happening in the protonated case is that his 31 now, which is positively charged, uh, or actually it's uh, his 84, which is the red one, okay, he actually forms a transition, and that actually helps to uh, the, the flipping of the proline over into the more stable uh, hydrophobic pocket. So this interaction had not been anticipated before, and so we predict it based on our calculation. It's a feature of the minimal free energy pathway. So we would suspect, for example, if one were to do mutagenesis and change AS34 into something that's not charged, you might recover uh, or, or you might prevent amyloid, amyloidogenesis, for example. Okay. So that's a couple of examples of some of the work that's been uh, out of my group more recently. So I'll just conclude by saying I showed you two things. One, temperature accelerated MD for enhanced conformational sampling and generation of initial paths. Uh, string method and collective variables, which is for, for convergence of minimal free energy paths that could be generated using, using TAM, and also can give us ideas about energetics of conformational transitions. So I, of course, have to acknowledge um, uh, Eric Vanden Eyden. Uh, and Luca Mariliano and my students Harish Vashis and Spencer Stover, funding from NSF, NIH, and all the simulations were done with the exception of the beta 2 microglobulin on uh, teragrid exceed resources. So I think I'm on time. Great. Thank you.